Let's open up that word to Matthew chapter 5. We'll be taking a look here from a while, a few weeks anyhow, at the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus has gathered some disciples and they've been wandering around doing different things, healing people and that sort of thing. He's preaching about the kingdom of God being at hand. Got a multitude of people that are, are following that are there, that are, some of them are, are there because they, they believe that he's the Messiah, they believe that he's the Lord, and they want to be there. They want to hear him. Some are there because they're curious. Some are there because they want to see what he's going to do next. Some are there to be healed. Some are there looking for a sign for the miracles. Others, the disciples, have left everything to follow him. He finds this, this place on this mountain where he, he goes up to, he sits down, and his disciples come to him. We've talked about that before. It means that school's in session, boys. Pay attention. And girls. This message that he gives here on the Sermon on the Mount, we looked a little bit in Luke. There was another one that he did someplace else that was similar. He repeated a few things here. He gets in a little bit more detail. This Sermon on the Mount is addressed to disciples and that it is addressed to us, to Christians, to believers, to followers of Christ. This is not those things that, that, hey, if you want to be a good person in the world, just go out there and try to do these things. Try to do these things without a relationship with Jesus Christ and see how far you get. These are not the things that make you a good person. These are things that will show the world that you are, in fact, a follower of Jesus Christ, that you are a disciple. These are the things that are, I don't want to call them rules, but laws or whatever. These are, these are the, the manifests that we as Christians follow as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. That's our citizenship now. We live here in this, this country as sojourners, as pilgrims, passing through. Our true citizenship is that in heaven. We may vote for our president, but we serve our king, don't we? And our focus is that. And in these things, he tells us what it should look like, what a citizen, what an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven, how we should live our lives. These, this is for us. This is for believers. Warren read that Revelation 3.20 verse this morning. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and whoever opens that door, I'll come in and sup with him and he with me. That's written to us. It has some application to the unbeliever, but it is written to us. It's pointed at us, saying, Christian, open your door. The Lord shouldn't be a visitor, should he? You don't knock on the door to your own house, do you? This is what it means, this is what it looks like to be a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, to be a disciple. And because of our relationship with him, we can live our lives this way. And in doing so, we find, as he starts out here, great blessing, our joy in following Jesus. Chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Seeing the multitude, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor, in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, 
for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. A week or so ago, we went through this Beatitudes. And this is what our attitudes should be if we want to live a joyful and blessed life. Meekness, humbleness, esteeming others more highly than ourselves, peacemakers, merciful. These are all things, all characteristics of that Christian, of somebody that realizes, first of all, their need for Jesus Christ, that we are are spiritually bankrupt, and apart from him we have no help of salvation. There are none good. No, not one, the Bible says. That leaves me out. I'm part of the none. We recognize our need for him. Our attitude is very different than the attitude of the world. The attitude of the world is all about self. All about pleasing the flesh. All about having our emotions satisfied. Just watch a couple of TV commercials, I'll tell you that. The, the advertisement people, they got, they got hold of that. They figured that out. Our attitude is very different. Our attitude is not one of self-serving and self-motivation and self-pleasing, but it's an attitude that, that recognizes our need for Christ and, and serves others. Being a peacemaker. The Bible tells us in as much as depends on you to be at peace with everyone. You can't be at peace with everyone because some people are going to be upset no matter what you do. But being a peacemaker, being merciful, showing mercy to others. We talked about that. We often want, we always, not often, we always want mercy for ourselves. Lord, be merciful to me. But sometimes our attitude is, be merciful to me, but get that other guy. The Lord shows us that as ambassadors of His, that as He is merciful, so should we be. His mercy was shown to us in that He died on that cross while we were yet enemies. That's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to wrap your head around that idea of dying for an enemy. To bring them peace. Isn't it? Dying for an enemy, somebody that, that, that's wronged you and hurt, hurt you, to bring them forgiveness. Dying for an enemy, to bring them blessing. Be merciful, and we will receive mercy. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. Hunger and thirst have a craving and a desire in your life to do that which is right, not in the eyes of men but in the eyes of the Lord. We don't have to guess and wonder and and try to figure it out. He's he's shown us what it is. He shows us what pleases Him. We know righteousness because we see righteousness in Jesus Christ. We have righteousness in His Word. He instructs us here in this sermon in righteousness. We should hunger and thirst, have a desire for that, and then we will be satisfied. When our attitude lines up with the attitudes of Christ, with the attitudes that we're talking about here, when our attitudes are right, then everything else falls into place. Then we can be blessed, we can be joyful, be happy. Our real needs, spiritual and physical, are taken care of. The emotions that we have fall in line with the word of God and are proper. Emotions are those to to kind of add flavor to life. Not to be the thing that, that leads us and drives us. When we have this right attitude, this right heart, this heart like Christ, this Christ like heart. Then everything else falls into place. When our attitude's not right, then everything else comes apart, doesn't it? It says, Blessed are those who persecute you for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, or who are persecuted, not the ones that persecute you, but those of us that are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for doing right. We've all seen and tasted part of that, a little bit here and there, been called names and whatnot, for doing what's right, and always standing on what the word of God says is right. It gets more and more difficult as our society, 
not just in this country, but around the world becomes more and more liberal and morality goes out the window to make that stand for what the Bible, for what the Lord says is right and moral. There's more and more persecution in that. There are people, Christians, believers, that give their lives daily now. Yeah, anybody ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs? You, you look at that, and when I first read it, I went, oh my God. And then I found out that there are more people martyred these days than there were then for loving Jesus. It says there in verse 12, it says, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In Acts chapter 5, verse 41, we see the disciples there have been taken before the council, before the, the scribes and the Pharisees, and they've been reprimanded, chastened, and told not to preach in Jesus' name anymore. Because as they went out after the day of Pentecost, as they went out and they preached in Jesus' name, as they reached down, Peter did there at the temple and raised up the lame, people were getting healed. The same works that Jesus was doing, they were doing also. They couldn't figure out what to do with these guys. They said, we know, we'll tell them not to do that. They told them the first time and they went ahead and did it anyhow. They told them the second time. And they said, well, you know what, this time let's go ahead and beat them up a little bit. So they beat them up and sent them on their way. Don't do this anymore. What was their response? Oh, man, we got beat up for talking about Jesus. Poor me. No. You see these guys, and they're, they're, they're leaving this. They're all beat up and probably, you know, wiping blood off one another and doing whatever it is that they're doing. Coming out of there, smiling and laughing. I can imagine what the people looking on saw, what they thought. What's the matter with these knotheads? <laughs> What's with you guys? You just got beat up. Yeah, we did. For preaching in Jesus' name, for making a stand. They rejoiced because they were counted worthy to be persecuted for His namesake. You get persecuted for His namesake, that means that Jesus is shining through. That means that He's doing something, not just in your life, but through your life. And that the people around Him are beginning to see Christ through you. The disciples there, the Sanhedrin, the council, they, they figured out that these guys were His disciples. They knew that they had been with Jesus by the way they spoke and the things that they did. It was obvious. It was evident. So rejoice. Be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Remember our citizenship? Remember where our home is? Home is where the heart is. Our heart is in Christ. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. The reward is that. I, I heard a story, and I assumed that it was true, and about a, a, a missionary couple that had spent a lifetime 30-some years, I believe it was, in some far-off, dark place in the world. And they were coming home about the time that a bunch of, of troops were coming home from World War II. We all know what that was like. They had these great ticker... How do you say that? The stuff coming down from tick, ticker tape parades. Yeah. We know what it was like. We just can't say it. They had all this stuff and this big fanfare and celebration for these heroes that were returning from the war. Rightfully so. And here this man and this woman who returned from their mission field wherever it was that they'd been for so long. On the same ship as many of them. Nobody knew. Nobody was there to greet them. No fanfare. No nothing like that. The man said to his wife, he says, here these, these men have, have just gone off to war. And we have gone and served our king. Gone off to that spiritual battle. They get this great reward, and what do we get? And the wife very wisely turned to her husband and said, Well, they're coming home. For them, this is, this is coming home from, from the battle that they've been. We're not home yet. Because heaven is their home. 
The fight's not over. They're not done. The battle hasn't ended. They may have come back to the, to the place where they were, but they're not home yet. I think of Don. Yeah, he, he retired as pastor, but he's not done yet. He's not home yet. The Lord's not finished yet. There's many things to be done. Verse 13, he says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Salt, we read through the Bible, there's plenty of places where it talks about salt and everything. It was part of the, the ingredients and the incense that they had in the, in the, in the tabernacle and the temple. It was to be added to the grain offerings that were given to the Lord. There was such a thing as a salt covenant. The Lord mentions that. And it's a, uh, it just means that it's a permanent covenant, irrevocable. The salt covenant. It was a, a covenant, a thing that they used for um, money. That saying is somebody's worth their salt. It's worth what they got paid. They earned it. Um, salt was oftentimes used as a disinfectant. You ever had salt in a wound? It'll disinfect it, but man, that gets kind of rough, doesn't it? It's like, put some of this under you. It'll make you feel better. But it does the job. Salt is off, was often used as a disinfectant. It was used as a preservative. You pack the meat and salt and everything, and it would preserve it so that you could keep it for longer. It was great when traveling in distances and all that stuff. Pack the meat and stuff in salt. It was also there for seasoning. Put a little salt on things. We still do that. I probably eat too much salt now, but you know. It's there at seasoning. It adds or enhances the flavor of the good things that you put it on. Jesus is telling us as, as disciples that we are the salt of the earth. We are that salt. In many ways, we are to be the salt that is a disinfectant. Have you ever thought about that? As the Lord moves us and uses us and brings us into different places and different situations with different people that are struggling with different things that are infected with sin and the result of that. The Lord comes and He may bring us into those situations and pour a little salt on that wound sometimes. And initially, it might be a little bit painful. Sometimes it's difficult to take someone that you know is not doing what they ought to. A brother or a sister that maybe is not following the Lord. Or somebody that doesn't know the Lord. It's hard sometimes. And sometimes it's painful to tell them that what you're doing, your lifestyle, your choices are ungodly. But when that comes with the, with, with the, 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 the cleaning the caring for, the, the nursing of that wound after that initial shock of that pain. There's a disinfectant and those, those things, those, that disease, that infection begins to die out. And as we continue to care for these people, to come into this situation and, and lead them into the way that they ought to be going, introduce them to the Lord, bring them to the Lord, then a healing can take place. Sometimes they don't really want to hear what we have to say right off. Sometimes it can be uncomfortable for us. But I tell you what, that stuff you put on that wound, that, that, it hurts, but it's necessary, isn't it? It's better to have that initial pain and be disinfected to be cleansed than it is to let that infection rot. I have a hard time going to a dentist because I know the initial pain is going to be worse than I imagine. You are not as bad as I imagine most of the time. But you know what? It's worth it. Sometimes that, that initial affliction may be more, but the end result is that disinfecting. Christians are our salt. Christians are a disinfectant in the world around us. 
if we stand for what's right, if we hunger and thirst for righteousness, if we have that attitude, if we know that we're serving our Lord, we can be that. Don't be afraid to make people uncomfortable. Because it may be the very thing that brings them to the place that they need to be where their hearts can open to the Lord. Sometimes that person that seems to us to be the most hard-hearted is the person most likely to break. Something that's hard and, and, and brittle breaks and shatters easily in the right conditions. To be that salt, to disinfect when we stand for righteousness. To be a preservative. To be a preservative. It's harder and harder as we th see things in our, our country, in our society, in our world, to imagine Christians as being a preservative. A preservative of godliness. And yet where would the world be without us? Not that we are the ones, but the Lord that works through us. Where would the world be without us? We're like a salt shaker. You know, the Lord's more like the salt. But where would the world be without those of us that will still stand up and say, no, that's not right. Those of us that will still stand up against ungodliness, against immorality. Those of us that will still stand up and say that the direction that we're going is wrong. Those of us that will stand up, we pray for our leaders. I know sometimes it seems to be choosing a lesser of two evils. But making those stands for those things that are right. I'm not a big advocate of a lot of political advocacy and everything, but each Christian ought to pray. Say, Lord, where would you have me? Where would you have me stand? And how would you have me do it? Christians that, that, that will cry out and say, you know what, abortion is wrong. Christians that will stand and cry out and say, you know what, homosexuality is wrong. We ought not to have same-sex marriage. And many, many other things, you, you name it. There's plenty to stand up and say, that's not right. No matter how they try to shut us down. Less and less and less are we having that preservative effect. But where would the world be if we didn't? It's kind of hard to imagine, isn't it? So we stand, we preserve. We preserve morality and righteousness as much as we possibly can. The end result and everything is up to the Lord, but we do our part. We do our part. A preservative, a season, a seasoning. We're to add some season to life. A good, a pleasant taste. You get, some, you get, you get hospital food. I don't know. I, what do they do with the flavor? How do they suck the flavor out of everything? The fork, the plastic fork, tastes, has more flavor than the food. <laughs> you need a little salt, a little something there, a little flavor. The flavor that we add, the season that we add as Christians should be joy, right? Are we not joyful? We may not always be happy, but we should have a joy that comes from the Lord, overflowing, no matter what's going on. People may look at us and say, wow, your life should be miserable. What's the matter with you? You're, you have joy. It's the joy of the Lord. We have peace. We should be, bring peace into a situation, a peacemaker. We have peace. You know how when a situation, there's a lot of stuff going on and people are kind of panicking and running around all over? All it takes is one calm, cool-headed person to come into that situation and bring things down, right? In a world gone mad, as Christians, we should be at peace. Have that peace that surpasses all understanding. 
and be able to, to come into someone's life that's out of control and bring some peace into that, some joy, some love, some compassion, some tenderness, some mercy. We think about that and what a wonderful season, what a wonderful flavor that is to bring that into that. Colossians chapter 4. Let's go ahead and turn there. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. I'm talking about our, our speech and how we talk to other people, not just other Christians. Let it be with grace. I had a situation at work where, as being the, the boss there, I have to deal with an employee in a disciplinary manner. But that situation can be dealt with. That speech can be graceful. You can bring grace into that situation. Seasoned with salt. The idea of the salt here as, as that preservative and maybe that disinfectant, that season of that salt that comes in there is truth. You've heard about sugar coating things? Sometimes we tend to want to do that too much. The heart is, the speech is, grace. Whatever the situation, to bring the grace of God into that situation, but not water down, not sugarcoat the truth that is there, but present the truth gracefully. The Bible tells us that we are to speak the truth in love. Now we've all had those people that blessed us by sharing the truth with us. Right? But not always... In love. You can read the book of Job and some of the things that his uh, so called friends had to say to him were true, at least in part. But there's times in there it's like, where's the love, guys? The love, the grace, the heart of Christ in that situation comes first, and then that truth is easier to take. Easier to swallow, if you will. It doesn't need to be sugar-coated. It doesn't need to be watered down. But speak that truth in love. Be honest. Be honest. Sometimes we need to confront things and situations and people. But we do that gracefully. Bringing the grace of God in that. And speaking the truth. The truth of God's word. And doing it in love. Or salt. If we do that, if we have that attitude, if we have that heart of, of Christ, that salt comes into that situation, to that wound, to that hurt, to that infection, and disinfects, preserves, and seasons, adds flavor, a good flavor, to life around us. We talked about being that, that person. Some see, you know, you, we all got people we see, and we kind of go, oh, God, they're coming. And others, we see, oh, good, they're coming. This attitude and this heart, this being salt and light, adds good things. Being salt and light, but if we have lost that flavor, if salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? Then it is good for nothing to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. If we lose that flavor, that salt, if we lose that grace, if we no longer stand for truth, if we no longer have that right attitude, if we, never, if we no longer come into the situation with joy and peace, if we go around acting the same, with the same heart, with the same attitude as the world, then we lose that flavor because we're no longer any different than they are. Salt without any flavor, what good is it going to do you to put that on your food? None at all. Tossed out, trampled, thrown away. No longer useful, 
no longer pleasant, no longer needed, no longer enjoyed. Christians stand as Christians with the attitude of Christ. Verse 14, he goes on to say that you are the light of the world. A city that, has set, that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp to put it under a basket. But on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men. That they may see your good works. And glorify your father in heaven. I, I read a couple of different things there. And um, one candle. Of course depending on all the stuff going on in the atmosphere and the dust and dirt and whatever like that, all the circumstances. One candle, one candle under just the right circumstances can be seen from three and a half miles away. Anywhere from a half a mile to three and a half miles depending on the circumstances. That's kind of amazing, isn't it? That that one little candle, that one little light can be seen from so far away. A little bit of light in the darkness is obvious. All darkness is is the absence of light. You can't fill something with darkness. All you can do is take out the light. You can fill a place with light, and the darkness is gone, but you can't fill a place up with darkness. You ever notice how hard that is? If you want to make it dark in here in the daytime, you've got to turn off the lights and close the blinds and do all this other stuff. It's really hard to do. But it's not hard at all to fill it with light, to bring light into the situation. He says, we are the light, the light of the world, a light that shines in the darkness. In the beginning, God made everything. On the first day, he created light. Interesting to me that, it, that light came before the sun. Scientists have some issues with some of that stuff. I don't. Because I know who the light is and where the light comes from. The light came after the light, life. There's life when the light's on, when the light comes. The sun wasn't made until the fourth day. In John chapter 1, we know this. John chapter 1, verse 4. It says, in him, Jesus was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. That light that we have, that light that shines, as he's talking about us being that light, that light is the life of Christ lived in us and through us. It's not us, it's not that we're so bright. It's Jesus Christ. And his life being lived through us that shines. He's the light. He's that source. Psalm 119 verse 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You're roaming around at night in the dark. It's a good thing to have a flashlight, right? So you don't trip and stumble and fall. Roaming around in the dark. God's word in John, it talked about Jesus being the Word. Is there that light that shines, that shows us where to go? It shows us where, what to watch out for, not to trip, not to stumble. That light that shines in this dark world. The light comes from Jesus Christ in His Word, in, his, in relationship with Him. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, let's go there. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful to even speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest the light, therefore he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, Christ will give you light. 
Jesus gives us that light, and sometimes that light shining in the darkness can bother people. You ever have a bright light shine in your face? You stand in front of somebody's car and they pull on the headlights with their high beams on? Or get those, those, those uh, uh, four-wheel drives with the lights way up here shining in your mirrors? That light can be blinding to you when you're in the dark. You're, you're in the dark and, you, and you, you've been in the dark for a while, you turn the light on and it's hard to get your focus. That light that exposes, that shows what's going on in the dark. Do you ever notice? Well, I don't know if any of you have ever been there. Back in the day, I went. A bar? They're not well lit. That's a good thing. <laughs> those things and those people that are there and living that lifestyle, they don't want to be a bunch of light shining on what's going on. I won't talk too much about that. But there's a reason for that. People like to do their dirty deeds in the dark, don't they? More stuff goes on at night than during the day. More wrong stuff, more bad stuff, more crime, more evil. More of those things happen in the night than they do in the daytime. Now I've heard, if you want to go and, and, and take something, do it quietly and calmly in the light of day because nobody expects anything. Anyhow, those dirty deeds are done in the dark because that light comes in and shines. When we come into a situation, when we come into people's lives as Christians, living for Christ, Him shining through us, living and speaking and sharing the Word of God, that light comes and it shines in their darkness. And sometimes they block their eyes because they don't want to see. They don't want to see what's going on. Sometimes it hurts their eyes. But have you ever noticed, have you ever been camping someplace where you have people sitting around a campfire? Maybe you haven't been camping, but you've seen it on TV. People sitting around a campfire, the people that, that are coming from there out in the, in the woods or out wherever they are, they can see into the light, see what's going on. You can be a long ways off and see what's happening in the light and see what's going on. But if you're in the light, you ever notice that it's harder to see off out into the darkness? And that's the Lord's way of keeping us focused on Him instead of all those things that are going bump out there in the night. Let them go bump. Keep your eyes on the Lord. But people out there in that darkness, they can see. They can see what we're doing in the light. It may be hard for them to get close because sometimes that light sort of blinds them. Sometimes it makes them uncomfortable. Sometimes it downright scares them. You come into some situations, say, praise God, Lord God Almighty. Thank you, Jesus. And... You all run like cockroaches when you turn the light on. He says for us to be light, to be light like that lamp that is lit, like that city on a hill. I can't wait. I think it's Highway 51 or whatever, that the loneliest road in the whole world that goes across Nevada. You can drive across there at night, and every once in a while, there's lights from a hill, there's a city on a hill. You can see them from afar off. Be noticeable. We can see us from afar off. That light, that lamp that's lit, you don't put it under a back basket. We put light shades on them. We don't put them under a basket. It's there to the purpose is to give that light off. Sometimes as Christians, we're, we're, we're kind of secret Christians, undercover Christians. Sometimes the basket that we put on is the trappings of the world, so to speak. We're not real open about our faith, about being Christians and who we are. Some people have to do a lot of digging and working and picking up the basket to look under that worldly facade that some people put on to find out that they really are Christians. Oh, well, I'm Christian and it's, it's just a personal thing. I don't like to talk about it too much. 
just between me and the Lord. Really? That's not what he's telling us. Let that light shine. Go to the, the place and get the Christian t-shirts and hats or whatever else it is that they got. But if you put that on, walk like a Christian. Act like a Christian. Shine like Christ. I had a t-shirt one, one time on the back of it. It said, if you need prayer, ask me. That was fun. <laughs> it was. People come along, oh, I like your shirt. You do? Do you need prayer? Oh, well, sure. Well, let me pray for you. Are you go praying for people in a parking lot at Walmart because they said they like your shirt? You know, if they're believers and they, they know they need prayer, they're all right, great, thank you, man. You know, if they're not, you're going to pray for me now? Can't you just put it on your prayer list and maybe do it Sunday when you're at church? Let that light shine. We are, verse 16, it says, let your light shine before men. Yeah, some might cover their eyes. Some might turn and go the other way. Some might be offended. Some might be drawn. Some might come. Some might give their lives to the Lord. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. What an awesome thing it is to be a Christian, shining, letting Jesus shine through, living your life for Him with joy and peace and mercy and grace and righteousness adding flavor to the world around you, being salt, shining in such a way that like them little bug zappers, people come and the sin is zapped out of their life and they become new creatures in Christ. That they, they're drawn to that light not to see you, not to glorify you, but to glorify our Father. What an awesome thing it is to have somebody spend time with you and walk away and say, Thank you, Father. Praise you, Jesus, for shining a light in my life. What a cool thing it is. And we're the only ones that can do that because of our relationship with Jesus.